You may wonder why the flower. <laughs> this is in honor of the father of all law, laws and codes, Hammurabi, king of Babylonia, who lived 2000 B.C., and whose wisdom has descended to us in a number of ways. One through the Justinian Code that followed, one through the English Bill of Rights, the Common Law of England, and the American Bill of Rights. They are all derived essentially from a code established 4,000 years ago. Most people don't realize this, and they also do not realize the tragedies that have separated the original from the present time. The code has been so mutilated that it is difficult to recognize it in these days. But in the original, it was really a document that should be restudied very soon by those interested in improving the general conditions of mankind. Hammurabi was a man of his day. He was a very powerful monarch. He was a ruler over several nations, most of them in the valley of the Euphrates. His original code was in cuneiform. It has been lost. It was variously transcribed in early times, and one or two of these translations and transcriptions have descended to us. I think one of the most important things in the code was his division of human society into three essential groups with the corresponding and appropriate responsibilities. He used the term aristocracy to represent the privileged class of people, the wealthy, the powerful, and the influential. He used the term the citizenry for all levels of people working in professions, art, crafts, and trades. And he used the idea of serfs or slaves for those a more humble estate. But the first thing that he did was to make this sound strange. But upon meant a second thought to realize how neatly he had phrased the circumstance. His law was this. The class with the greatest authority had the greatest responsibility. Also, the sins of the great were much more dangerous and deep and terrible than the sins of the lowly. He said that the individual who had much, knew much, possessed much, had a greater duty to the state, to his God, and to his fellow man. And if he committed a crime, his punishment should be much greater than that bestowed upon the humble. In other words, every step upward is a step in burden to responsibility, need, greater need for maturity of thought, and absolute need for honesty. And the crimes of the great are far more dangerous to themselves and the world than the crimes of the humble. This was one of his first uh, cataclysms. Uh, this was his first classification as to where responsibility should be placed. The second group of, he declared to have inalienable rights. The Code of Kamarabi says that all three divisions of society have inalienable rights before God and man, and that these rights cannot be transgressed without danger to the social system to which they belong. Another point that was interesting is in, in his legal code was that in, in cases involving litigation, no lawyers were to be permitted in the court. <laughs> Every per, a person in litigation had to plead his own case in person. He might bring in witnesses to support him, documents if available. And both sides were permitted to have their say. But neither side was to be represented by learned counsel. Each one had to tell his story in his own words, for this was the only way that justice could be attained. 
if by any chance or circumstance the disputing parties were uncertain or unsettled or the judgment seemed unfair Hammurabi said there is one final court of appeal that's me any person bond or free aristocrat or slave who feel that they are improperly treated and cannot get redress in the common courts can petition to come to me and I will see them no matter who they are I will see the slave or the serf just as quickly as anyone else and I will be accompanied by learned people who can cover areas of knowledge in which I might be deficient every effort will be made to see that justice is fair to all concerned and all unfairness and ulterior motives are punishable by law now this is putting it pretty straight then of course he had uh, in those days it was perfectly proper and considered right to keep slaves now came the rights and privileges of slaves they had inalienable rights that could not be transgressed they had the right of being treated reasonably fairly pleasantly for their entire period they had the right to petition if against any injustice they had to have good living conditions good food a proper opportunity to grow and if they wanted education it could be granted to them if they wanted it if a slave became obviously superior to his position the state could purchase him and free him if it doesn't did, did, not, did not do that the master of the slave was invited to donate him to the state he was then put in school educated and taught in whatever the branch of learning he was naturally inclined to and made an equal to all other men there was no such a thing as a slave who could be mistreated in any way he had to be regarded as a person he had to be given all necessary care and attention and if he desired education cultural advantage or freedom of religion it was granted to him and for unusual achievements he was uh, freed this was the way it was and he says in the code or in the commentary on it that a great many nobles or aristocrats freed their slaves on their deathbed that is on the deathbed of the noble he freed his slaves before he died he was probably one of the first uh, to uh, bring this point out and it might be known or mentioned that one of the last acts of George Washington was to free his slaves that goes back 4,000 years in the literary and cultural history of mankind another very important rule or a part of the doctrine of Hammurabi was the responsibility of artisans to each other and to the state when one private citizen cheated another private citizen he damaged the state and that was all there was to it if he did not keep his contracts if he used inferior materials if he overcharged these were not things to be passed over as merely competition they were subject to punishment and a house that was badly built and was not up to the proper qualifications as specified and gave trouble could be torn down and rebuilt at the expense of the people who built it if, his, if the carpenters did it they would have to do it over again at their own expense nothing could be promised that was not fulfilled and the fulfillment had to be according to the promise there was no need for bonds because the state was the bond for all of it the state bonded each citizen if the citizen was right the state supported him if he was wrong the state sentenced him accordingly actually also there were many other very curious and interesting phases in this problem one of the phases that uh, I think we are all more or less interested in today with our present problems is the difficulties with families 
Actually, the uh, code of Hammurabi goes right down into the private home of the citizens. In the code of Hammurabi, women had exactly the same legal privileges as men, could own their own property. When they married, the husband did not have the right to use his wife's property except by a personal request by herself. She had caught appeal at any and all times. And if there was a divorce which could be granted according to the code, under normal circumstances, the children in all cases were placed in the custody of the mother. Also, any properties that she might have in a divorce that she brought to a marriage could be restored to her. There was no way in which a husband could claim his wife's dowry or a wife could profit by the possessions of her husband if there was a settlement. Each person received back what they started with, and there was no profit whatsoever to be involved from a divorce. This was a pretty rigid stuff for 4,000 years ago, but it was something that worked very well as long as it was enforced. I, among those who came after it was Lycurgus of Sparta. He was a code maker of somewhat lesser quality, but of, with very interesting peculiarities and specialties. According to Lycurgus, the basis of citizenship was frugality. Debt was forbidden by law. And the individual who overbought himself or placed himself in a position where he had to commit an unreasonable or unlawful act in order to meet his debts was found guilty first of his own extravagance and was properly chastised. It was the problem of Lycurgus was to keep people simple, direct, honest, and dedicated to the values and realities of life. The Justinian Code was built very largely upon the Code of Hammurabi. And then we come to another very interesting phase of the whole situation. In 1640 or thereabouts, Lord Bacon's Code for England was more or less officially recorded and stated. Actually, the uh, law, common law of England was framed by Bacon, and this common law was based solidly upon the Code of Hammurabi. The common law of England was, took the place of jailment for debt and all this type of thing that had burdened the country for a long time. Bacon also divided the problems of knowledge into three levels, tradition, experience, and experimentation. Now he said these are the three values upon which a civilization must build. They're taken directly from antiquity. The traditional part of law is in history. And history today is the most ignored phase of human knowledge. We have become so suspicious of the integrities of our historians that we are inclined to ignore the whole subject. Yet history has to be the basis of one very great generality, namely what law is, why it functions, what it is, where it functions. Law is something, as Bacon pointed out, that is universal. Universal law is something that has nothing to do with the narrow confines of a planet. Universal law is the power, principle, and pattern by means of which existence occurs in any phase or on any level. The same phase in existence all the way through, whether it be checked through dimensions or integrities. Therefore, law is finally shown to be what it is by what it does. There is no escaping the consequences of action. And the law, therefore, is based upon the comparative consequences of various actions committed by sentient beings. These sentient beings get into all kinds of muddles and puddles and also get themselves into difficulties, sometimes difficult to escape. But laws are there, and they say, as the cause, 
so the re consequence. As ye sow, so shall ye reap, is immutable. Now the universal laws are the basis of the maintenance of the galaxies, of the solar systems, of the planets, and of all the little birds and bugs that exist on our planet. Everything that exists, exists under law. The Rosicrucians, following in some of these patterns, declared that there were three great textbooks of law by which we were to understand the values of life. And in the theological days, the first of these textbooks was considered to be uh, religion. The second textbook was the planet and all the creatures that lived on it. And the third textbook was the human body. These are the basis of laws. And following Paracelsus, and to a great degree most of the alchemists, we can consider law as applicable to the human body. Now if the human body got into a muddle such as at present in, in political life concerning the election of the next candidates for public office, if that happened in the body, it would die. <laughs> if you put the body under the pressure of conflict by competition of functions, you would end the body. It couldn't survive. Yet the body probably has a larger population than China. Probably a larger population than the whole earth put together and some extra earth thrown in. Because each cell, each minute living thing in the human body has, as Hammurabi would have pointed out socially, rights that, are, that cannot be violated with impunity. Every particle in space has laws. Its value to the complete pattern depends upon the right administration of those laws. If, the, if this little cell is abused and loses the power to function, it is a detriment to the cultural advancement of the total body. So the body becomes a sort of ground to look over in connection with all governments. The body has three suits of government. It has the head, the heart, and the generative system. These must work together. If the heart denies the mind, the mind designs, designs the heart, we will have trouble. We have to give to each part of the body its proper due and teach it through our own mental and moral pressure to keep the rules and keep the laws governing itself. Now we come today into a conflict between natural law and political law. We come into a conflict where justice is not termed in the fulfillment of law, but very largely in the fulfillment of ambition. Justice is now constantly changing the rules to adapt them to an unlawful situation. When we get a problem today, we don't go back to the code for the answer. We change the law of the moment to exonerate the person we wish to have win. This is a very serious mistake because nature shows no favoritism of any kind, nor will it perpetuate any favoritism. Nature has also given us, however, a, re a reasoning faculty, a power of mind, in order that we may observe and experiment with the rules of life. We know definitely that we are part of something bigger than this little world we live in now. How big this something is, we do not know. But we realize that within it, we all live and move and have our being. We know that there are rules that govern the planet's motions. That there are rules that govern the materials inside of the earth. We know there are rules concerning conduct and extravagance and wrong attitudes of all kinds. We know what causes sickness of the mind, the soul, and the body. Yet our present concern is not to prevent this sickness, but to endure it and make rules to prove that the wrong is right. As a result of that, we have now an increasing crime wave such as we have never known before. And the greatest so-called progressive nations are the nations with the greatest industrial scientific advancements are in the deepest trouble. 
and out of all the wars of the past and out of all the strategies and all the conflicts of antiquity we are today nearer to a world war than we have ever been before we are not doing the things that are right therefore we have to question the procedures which bring them about we know that whatever is happening is what we deserve and it is rather painful to contemplate that we deserve what we deserve but we do and the only way to change the situation is to take a new relationship with life itself we've got to begin to realize that we are not here to spend most of our time having fun we are not here to run each other into bankruptcy we are not here to dominate other countries we are not here to compete over religious problems we are here to live according to natural law and that natural law is cooperation it is what we get to get together and live as one family on one little ball in space and until we do that we're going to be in the same difficulties yesterday today and forever we can't get away from this we're trying everything we can think of we cannot elect people to be honest for us we have to be honest for the leaders we elect and support the right ones we cannot connive people in pol into political positions and then suffer from the consequences of their misdoings we have to start with our own recognition that we have got to live within our means and to live within our means means to live within the capacities and possibilities of the little ball we live on in space we have a planet that has limited resources and we have unlimited ambitions we have a world in which there is enough but there is not enough to be wasted constantly we are gradually catching up to the deficiencies resulting from wanton waste as Ben Franklin called it for he said that wanton waste always results in woeful want and that is exactly the situation we are in but we are thinking of trying to solve it without changing ourselves little and large we want to have our own private purposes we want these purposes to be as selfish as we want them to be if we want to drink ourselves to death we declare that we have the inalienable right to do so if we wish to be victims of narcotics it's too bad but that is still our right and we have done nothing basically to bring the laws of the political structure into harmony with the laws of nature and the rules and regimes of common sense this has to change because we have now 4000 years of written experience recorded experience in China in Egypt and in Mesopotamia and for that matter also in the early days and years of our own western hemisphere we know what happens to those who do not keep the rules and we therefore look out upon the ruin of all the civilizations that have gone before they have all died from the same cause luxury and selfishness they have all abused the natural privileges of life they have tried to be to compete with each other they have tried to lay out their own territories and take on as many other people's territory as possible all of this it brought every empire on earth to ruin and in the process of doing so it has depleted the planet of invaluable natural Uh, resources it has impoverished us and failed utterly to bring us bring us progress now we talk about progress in terms of computers we talk about it in terms of nuclear fission we wish to have everybody realize that we are going further out into space than we ever did before but here on this planet we have millions of people dying from human selfishness and it's just about time to find out what constitutes success success is not getting as much as you can success is having enough and using it well and giving the other person a chance these things we are beginning to learn but when the time comes where we stand back of the better convictions that are coming to us every day through the mistakes that we are making actually the entire problem of natural law is rounded upon one point we are here temporarily 
Our journey here may be one of many trips, and most of antiquity accepted the doctrine of rebirth. But the point is that this little life that we have now has a limitation upon it. And uh, we are reminded that uh, the Druids of Britain in ancient days made documentary disposal of their goods, leaving their possessions to themselves in the next embodiment, which was a process that finally was negated out because there were no claimants. <laughs> Therefore, this uh, problem does remain, however. We are here at 75, 85, 95, 105 years. We are here on a temporary basis. And yet on a temporary basis, we are trying to build an eternal foundation. We are trying to live every day as though we would live forever. We are trying desperately to create the concept of permanent progress on a level which can never be true. The only things that we can really call progress are the changes within ourselves that give us a greater personal integrity which we can take with us into the future wherever it may be. We no longer believe in the old doctrines of heaven and hell, but we do believe in cause and effect. And we have to cause the better world if we want it, and if we do not cause it, we will not have it. So we are thinking very much now of how we can do some of these things that are personally necessary. But to do this, we have to refocus our own attention on what is doable and what is useful. We cannot go on as we go wrongly thinking and badly acting and continue indefinitely. We are going to run out of planet. We are going to run out of resource. Now our great abstract hope is that when we get through ruining this planet, we'll find another one that we can move on to. The only one that we've seen yet was worse than this, the moon. And we don't have no uh, realization as to whether any of the others are habitable. We think they may be, but we're not sure. But right here we have a planet that is ours to take care of. It is ours to protect. And it is something that is so useful and so valuable that we cannot afford to waste it. We all have generations to follow after us who must take up the bankruptcy which we leave behind. And this is not a pleasant thought when it comes to natural resources. There isn't a day that goes by that we are not mentioned as having become short in something. We have exploring now the polar caps to try to find some more petroleum or something of that kind. But this is Earth is a bottle. It only has certain contents. And we have no proof that any of this material will revitalize or renew itself except wood. Wood can grow again. But otherwise, all the natural resources that we have, once they are gone, they are gone. Surely they might become available again if we give them the millions of years that were used to produce the ones we are now wasting. But for the most part, when this is empty, we are finished. Now, we've got to begin to think in these terms instead of more corporations, bigger business, more progress, all in material things. We are eternal divine beings locked into a materiality that we have created for ourselves. We would hate to assume, except for a few atheists, that we are nothing and go nowhere. But at the same time, we are in an environment which we have created an environment in which we have gradually become guilty of wasting the resources of nature. We've got to do something about it, and we've got to put this high on the list of required improvements. We, there's no use trying to perpetuate a situation that has brought us only what we now have. We cannot allow the world to just drift towards oblivion because we are content to sit down five hours a day in front of the television show. Now, we, do, we are not doing anything with it. Education is also giving us a bad time. Education has been greatly admired, greatly talked about, and deified for years. But education's primary problem in the beginning was to keep us out of trouble, and now is to get us out of trouble. 
education must do something. Education cannot be that the highest award gives us a doctorate in some university. What we need now is an education that teaches us to take care of our planet and ourselves. The type problem of practical education is that the young people of the world must be taught that they are responsible for the futures they are building. And they must be educated to build a better future than their parents built. Now, in some cases, the parents are perfectly good people. But the temptations and pressures of this generation have turned young people away from the essential points and values of life. We have very much need of having education that teaches the individual to live a better life than we are living today. Education should teach him why he should become temperate in his habits, that he should devote more time to the, th the theories and pr principles of good citizenship, why he may be, must and become a good family person, where he must give proper attention to the close responsibilities that nature has bestowed upon him. Nature has made men and women to be fathers and mothers, and in that the uh, nature has a plan. And if nature's plan is outraged, we have more trouble. The moment we do things badly, we suffer. And we are doing them so badly now that suffering is almost universal. So we have to start to educate people in responsibility and not opportunity. I remember an old barber I knew in New York who came over from the old country, and he came here because of the fact that America was the land of infinite opportunity. What he should have said, it is a land of infinite responsibility. Every enlargement of opportunity brings with it a corresponding increase in responsibility. And when that part is omitted, opportunity becomes a, a pass. It becomes something that can never be justified and never be right. So education has got to change. It has to change, and we have to help to make it change. And parents must look into these matters when they decide colleges or universities to which their children should go. Or these children themselves decide what kind of education they need. Everyone today needs an education that teaches him to be a square dealer. It needs an education that makes him know firmly and certainly that honesty is the best policy. He can't learn this from his associates. He can't learn it from society as it is today. But he can learn it when dishonesty comes down on his own head with tragic consequences. We have to get an idealism into our living. We have to realize that we are not here simply to fulfill ambitions or accumulate wealth. We are here by natural law. And the natural law says we are here to grow. We are here to become better human beings. More understanding, more enlightened, more dedicated. We are here to do things better. We are here to enrich the cultures of life. We are here to leave this world a better place than we found it. These things are not being emphasized. We are already finding case after case of public office being exploited. Well, Hammurabi had a real answer for that. And every individual who has greater privileges, greater opportunities, or greater means must share in a greater responsibility. And that which might be seen only a small mistake to a, some humble craftsman can be a matter of the greatest importance when it is traced to a person of, uh, who is educated, affluent, and in positions of authority. We have to punish that most which has the greatest knowledge. Therefore, knowledge is a responsibility. Knowledge is something that has to be used or it will be abused. And if it is abused, it will destroy the very purpose of itself. Let's go back with the, uh, the uh, theologians back in the time of the alchemists and people of this character. They said that the great textbook of nature is of the greatest importance to us all. Paracelsus said, to understand the book of nature, you must walk each one of its pages with your own feet. You've got to be part of it. You've got to learn from it every day. 
If you want to understand nature, walk in a garden. If you want to understand nature, climb a cliff. If you want to understand nature, look at the ocean, the sky, the, mo the motions of the planets, and realize that there is a supreme law governing all things, and that at the present time man has been mostly a violator of that law. He has ignored it and divided up the earth to his own convenience. And by dividing it has created separateness, and separateness has ended in endless warfare and confusion. Man has simply not understood. Why has he not understood? That is probably due to an innate streak of selfishness. The mind of thinking begun, begins to think of what it can do to profit itself at something else's expense. When this starts in, it goes on age after age, and there is nothing to correct it. We used to believe that religion was the answer to any of these problems. It probably was to a measure at the time of Hammurabi, because at that time religion was largely a means of advancing all forms of useful art and knowledge. All education was in the keeping of the priesthood. And war came, and pillage came, the old temples and the old priesthoods were dissipated. Nothing remained but inscriptions on ancient stones. The, finally, the selfish and the ruthless inherited the earth. But in the ancient times, there were these things to think about, and they are still here to think about. And men like Ben Franklin thought about them. He knew the money of these principles because he was quite a scholar in his own right. He knew this penalty for abuse and waste. We are not aware of that. We know that a certain amount by our schooling but we do not realize that schooling should teach us moral integrity. We are so afraid that instruction will make us religious. Now, uh, the, most people say they don't mean it that way. They just don't want it to be theological. They don't want a theological system to dominate the country or the world. Well, we can agree with them theoretically. But if you consider theology and religion as identical, you're in a difficulty. Actually, the religion is not theological. Religion is ethical and moral. And a religion is simply man's ability to understand and accept the workings of the divine principle at the source of life. Man must let recognize and honor the great laws of nature. He cannot escape the law of gravity, and he will have to accept it whether he likes it or not. All through nature are laws. These laws need understanding. And one of the things that we have to finally also discover is that these laws are not blind. These laws are not just simply mechanical conditions existing in space. That behind all of the phenomena of existence is a tremendous spiritual power. A power that is always right and against which there can be no rebellion the rebel must inevitably and eternally destroy himself. So having accepted finally that there are rules and that these rules are real, we should begin to teach them. We should make the importance of these rules come home to the young before they wreck their lives with narcotics. These rules should become part of our way of life, which they should not be condoned when they are broken. They should be kept manifested and applied. We need all this in order to bring about a, a harmony between the universe as it is and the world as man wants it to be. Man does not want what is best. Man wants what he wants regardless of whether it is good, bad, or indifferent. He does not fight for principle, he fights for personal power. He does not seek the common good. He seeks the supremacy of himself over some adversary or barrier. How are we going to get him out of this kind of thinking? Well, nearly always there has to be some kind of a precedent established. We are going to have to find places where influence in the right direction can be improved and increased. We have to have the emphasis shifted from materialism to idealism. We have to have the individual honored for integrity and not for profit. This type of thing will have to come. Now, how do we know we'll have to come? Well, we're dying for lack of it right now. 
and we are looking forward with great hope to the future. We believe that in the next generation we are going to have greater emphasis upon the integrities that are important and necessary to our survival. Therefore, we must begin these integrities now. A lot of people are going to have to give up bad habits. Some are going to have to give up neglecting their families. Some of them are going to have to give up unreasonable profits. But unless everything is brought into a pattern universally acceptable by nature, we're all in trouble. As long as we think that there's a profit to be taken by getting the oil out of the ground, they're going to have more trouble because for the profit we're wasting the oil. We say they're not wasting it, we're helping to use all these vehicles. Well, a large number of these vehicles are unnecessary. In the more than that, the economy has never been the principal consideration in these matters. It is talked about, but the individual wants the big, the wonderful, the powerful, and all this type of thing, and down goes that supply. Now, when it's gone, it's gone, and it's going fast. It doesn't take long for eight, for six billion people to use it up. And it's already in short supply in many places. We have upset the climate of the planet so badly that now we have droughts where we should have rain and we have dust storms where we might have snow. These things are due largely to atmospheric pollution and to the use of various chemicals and so forth that are detrimental. Our foods are filled with chemicals. Our, our lives are obsessed with luxuries and we simply don't care. Now if we don't care, we won't stay. Something that cares more, some little bugger bee will take over because we have failed completely to meet the challenge of life. Well, for years we've had a kind of a little feeling that there were people who understood this and we're happy to know that there are. We are not all alone in our realization of the facts of life. And many of us who have tried very hard to help to bring about a better day may live to see it. But whatever happens is we've got to get to work and do it. We've got to make the ideal come true. We've got to realize the reality of a universal truth. A truth that is not a matter of creeds or sects or religious tolerances. A truth which is the eternal way of truth the way of life, the way of God, the way of nature. And that these, these ways, all of which finally are one, uh, have to be followed, have to be obeyed, have to be explored, have to be scientifically examined and applied. But we, are always, we should always be working to find out what nature wants, not what we want. We know what we want. We've had it a long time and are in trouble for having it. But what we really need to know is what nature demands, what the universe knows to be necessary, what life requires. It requires something more than the fulfillment of the endless ambitions of little people. Now ambitions that are unfulfilled end in neurosis. Unreasonable ambitions will ultimately be unfulfilled. So neurosis becomes widespread. Every time we are frustrated in our misdeeds, we get sicker. Therefore, we have to stop the misdeeds in order to get well. Actually, we are not in a condition where no, nothing is final and ultimate. As long as the human being will try, as long as he will desperately endeavor to be right in the circumstances of personal and collective existence, as long as he is fair in his weights and measures, there is a good chance that he can restore the world that he, would like, that he wants to have come back to him. He could have happiness and pleasure. But happiness must be harmless. Pleasures must be moderate. And the real integrity of a satisfied life is internal adjustment with truth. Wherever we love, we are drawn together. Wherever we hate, we are separated. Wherever we are suspicious, we divide. We must learn constructive relationships with each other we must learn constructive relationships with the stranger outside the gate. We must realize that none of the problems of nations will ever be solved by civil war. It is an entirely wrong and it is being supported and supplied for profit. These things must be changed. 
We are here not to find out how many different countries we can have. We are here to find out how soon we can have one happy world, a world of people working together for the final good of all that lives. These other things are simply arbitrary, artificial, and exist only to exploit the resources and life values of the person. The time has come to change this entire way of life and to do things as they should be done while there is still an opportunity to do so. So we go back again now to Mr. Bacon's code because there's something there that's very interesting. That the purpose of science is to justify faith. Now this seems to be a direct bearing from Plato. For Plato was the one who said that the end of wisdom is the perfection of faith. The individual who is truly wise believes, believes in universal good, believes in a universal power of the source of life, believes that the good life is the way of freedom and happiness, and that those who live a good life here face the unknown future with a good hope. These things are part of the Baconian speculation. Bacon has been regarded as one of the founders of science. But science is nothing in itself. Science is not fulfilled by discovering holes in space or counting the many stars in the galaxy. Science has as its purpose to build the solid facts underneath our lives that there is a divine purpose, that there is a universal law, and that it is the duty of science to clarify these facts and to find these laws and help us to live them that all of these other magnificent, glamorous discoveries only complicate living and furthermore diminish natural resources. We are outgrowing ourselves. We are gaining a certain sense of superiority that we are not justified in. We are not justified in the belief that we are better off than they ever were before or that we are the noblest creatures ever fashioned. We are only justified to know when we'll do it right, do it honestly, and do it kindly. We are tired of the constant strategies and selfish byways of human thinking. We are no longer interested in gossip. We are no longer interested in all these little selfish smallnesses that have divided humanity since the dawn of time. We are now moving toward the 21st century. We are moving out of 2,000 years of post-Christian problems. We are moving into a new world order of life. We must take into that something besides the old baggage. We cannot afford to take into the new the the rubbish of the old. We must take into the new a new dream, a new hope, a new aspiration, a new willingness to sacrifice for principles, a new integrity. Unless we do this, the problems that we see we face will never be solved. Bacon gives us also another very good and proper way of looking at this. Actually, every individual's personal life is an an action of divine law. The individual's own personal existence is his most immediate spiritual experience. It is his most immediate opportunity to grow, to correct the mistakes of the past, to vitalize the virtues of the future. Therefore, to the degree that we reorganize our own lives and thinking, to the degree that we become better people ourselves, to that degree we keep trust with the future and keep faith with the integrities of life. It is an marvelous thing to view the galaxy as we do even at night in the sky. The telescopes, the telescopes make us more detailed knowledge, but the real facts and the telescope is unnecessary. There we are on a little ball in the midst of an infinite distribution of worlds. Worlds beyond measure, worlds beyond concept, worlds beyond the measures of time or place. Here we are orphans, so to say. There is no physical connection between us and all these other worlds, but inside of us we are part of all of them. There is an internal connection, an eternal connection, by which life is united to life wherever it is. Whatever it does, it is part of all. 
It is perfectly possible for us to become citizens of space while we're still sitting here on this molehill. It is perfect poss perfectly possible for us to realize the immortality of ourselves, the eternality of ourselves, the unending growth of ourselves, even while we are only limited to one little planet. But we must have dreams. We must have ideals. We must have hopes. We must have realizations of the immensity of our own privilege, our own opportunity to be part of something that is going on to the perfection of the law that created it. We must realize that we are citizens of one vast universe, many of universes as we see them. We are citizens of eternity as well as of time. We are not only here for a few years, maybe come back again a few dozen times, we are part of eternity and always will be. And as we grow, we will release more of this eternity from within ourselves. We will become greater people. We will become wiser and nobler and more loving. And we will build a world that can endure because there is nothing to wreck it. The only thing to wreck that can wreck humanity is humanity. And it's inhumanity. Therefore, these things have got to come out and be taught. They've got to become part of the new century or there won't be any new century worth living in. If we simply push the present problem into some other administration, we are failing completely in the principal purpose for our existence. So we want you to very seriously think about these things and realize the relationship between universal law and the legislative processes of modern society. We elect various officials to various capacities and duties and we appoint them. We do not know whether they are capable or not. We do not know whether they have the proper integrities that we need or not. We simply elect them because of a poll. We do not know what these people are doing or why. We need representation. We have to have it. But we have to have some assurance that those whom we give power over us are worthy of that power. There is where Hammurabi's law comes in. The individual who becomes a governor of others must be above reproach. And if by any chance he is not above reproach, he must be punished far more seriously than the average individual. He must be made to realize that his opportunity to serve is his responsibility to integrity. And if this is not emphasized, if we continue to buy our way into various public offices, we will have the same problems forever. Therefore, even in now, while we probably can't change things that fast, it is very necessary for us to think more and more about what we need, and that it is more important than what we want, that it is important and necessary for us to build a future or there will not be one. The old Nordic myth of the great war and the war in heaven, the Armageddon, and of the uh, Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods, was when perversion and disturbance and error dominated the world. The great confusion, the last great war was fought. And the last great war, in fact, in philosophy, is the battle between integrity and selfishness. It is the battle between the individual doing what he should do and the individual allowing things to be done that should not be done and performing such imperfect actions himself. So we need to have a, a real insight that the time is very, very near when we have got to take it as make a serious study of ourselves. Now such serious studies are far more important, it seems to me, than an effort to discover the native home of some clam or something of this nature, for which thousands of dollars will be allocated, millions of dollars to be allocated, to find some little fragment of knowledge uh, that will make very little difference to us, maybe a slight difference to the clam involved. <laughs> These great grants of money should be used primarily to find the difference between right and wrong, to find the difference between virtue and vice, and also to find the way to conserve resources rather than to enlarge profits. We've got to learn gradually uh, to do things differently. One way is being forced upon us. At this particular moment, 
our traffic problem is practically impossible. We are now so congested that it takes sometimes hours to go a few blocks. It's getting worse. We're selling more cars every day and, the, and there are no roads suitable for them. If we continue long enough, we'll have to require all of the surface of the earth to be changed into highways. This is not very practical as there are a number of structures on some of these places. But there is something that has to be done there is no reason why a civilized humanity should work itself into a problem of this kind. It should have been solved before it started because anyone with a little thought knew what was coming. And we have other things just the same way. Everything is sacrificed because its change would interfere with business, would interfere with profits, would reduce sales, and this in turn would reduce employment and this in turn would reduce income and this in turn would reduce sales and we go right back where we started from these are childish facts we have got to outgrow them we've got to begin to think as mature people as children we can think as children think we can play with the toys of ch children as children did in the Greek legend of Dionysus Dionysus was the little son of Zeus who was to be the savior of mankind, the messianic infant in the Greek mythology. And it liked to play. And uh, there were grave, very difficult, wicked ogres out there in space. There were giants who wanted to destroy this child. So what did they do? They spread toys in front of it all kinds of playthings that a little child would love. And they kept spreading these uh, toys further and further away from the protection of the heavenly family. And finally, when they got this little child way out in the wilderness, then they killed it. Now this is what we are more or less doing today. We are the little child and they're putting the toys in front of us. They're putting these toys where we can play with them. And we're so full of play and so full of fun that we follow these toys out of the light of truth into a darkness so terrible that it is fatal to us. And out there are the, the ogres, the giants, the evil forces of selfishness, superstition and fear to destroy the little spiritual child. The Greek myth, myth is very telling, very interesting and very informing. Now we have all the little toys being sprinkled out in front of humanity. We have television, we have radio, we have uh, all the new different types of music and art and literature. We have all kinds of recreations. We have everything you can think of on the level of children. And we are being led little by little away from the solid values of life out into the wilderness of hard, hard rock and the like until we get so far away that the ogres of selfishness superstition and fear can destroy us. It's a good message coming down from about 2500 BC, about 2500 years ago. We are all following toys, collecting toys. They're making more expensive toys for us every day. And we have to do everything we can possibly think of in order to get money enough to buy the toys. And little by little, to get the toys, we are sacrificing the solid values of life. We want just fun, but there can be no fun in a shattered and, and broken world. We have to put it together as soon as we can. And to put it together, the first step is ourselves. Now, of course, there's a very valuable point in this. We may not be able to change other people, but once we have changed ourselves, we have made an important, lasting contribution to good. The growth that we make goes with us beyond the grave. The toys are broken and thrown away. The body is cast off. But the soul, with all that it has learned and known and loved and thought that was real, that goes on. We are building eternal values in ourselves, and these in turn become part of the eternal value of humankind. Each individual, when they begin to discipline themselves, 
is, he begins a new career that goes on forever. Once discipline becomes valued and accepted, the individual discovers the joy of doing things right, the joy of obedience rather than disobedience, and no longer considers truth as a limitation upon happiness. It is not. It is the source of the uh, fulfillment of all real happiness. So little by little, we can gradually come to see that there is an interval between the divine plan in which we live and the human systems which we have created to avoid the responsibilities of our true purpose. I practically everything we are doing now is to help us to escape the things that are necessary. We reject them because they are not according to our present choice. We do not want to think. We do not want to waste our time growing. We want to have fun right now. When you do that to the body, you have a sick body. When you do that to a country, you have a sick country. And when all the world gathers together and does it, we have a sick world. Now, sickness is a rate of vibration. All things are. Integrity is a rate of vibration. And even one single spark of light somewhere on the planet continues to shine. There's a wonderful saying, there's not a dark, enough darkness in all the world to hide the light of a single candle. So that the, there is not one single individual growing up and becoming better who is not contributing to the complete re renovation of civilization. The little lights get more common. The procession of candles increases. And little by little, the light of the soul obscures uh, the uh, problems or fulfills the needs that we have they, that to cover that which has been obscured by darkness so we have the right to become part of a little procession of light bearers that goes on getting a few new members every once in a while and little by little this great procession of the light goes out not only here but off into space to make a better forever for us to all look forward to, which is something pretty rather good if you get it in the proper way. There is something, therefore, to be said that one kind deed is never lost. One kind thought is never lost. These vibrations add up. And all of the reservoirs of good in nature are nourished just as the reservoirs of bad are overflowing. Uh, the vibratory problem has been taken up in India very strongly by a number of leaders. That all of the vibrations of those who are dedicated, these little sparks of integrity, all come together. All that is good mingles with all that is good. The two candles may be of a different faith or a different race, but they can come together in peace and harmony. Therefore, there is always a unifying process in truth and a dividing process in evil. In evil, there is no comradeship. There is no relationship that can build. This is why we cannot hope to build an evil world or be afraid we're going to have one. That which is wrong cannot meet and mingle other things that are wrong. The crimes of one person cannot be nullified by the crimes of another. Actually, there is no possible way of evil becoming immortal. There is no way of it becoming eternal because evil hates itself and evil in each individual fights evil in all other individuals whereas the good in one finds joy in the good of another. So good is forever building and evil is forever tearing down the very processes of itself. But evil in tearing itself down brings down civilization after civilization that somewhere along the line has dedicated itself to evil. When this happens, the problem goes on forever. But we now have very good hopes. Things look a little better than they did. There is a, a, mad, there is a danger, as Emerson might say, that the God has let loose a thinker or two <laughs> that uh, there is a tendency at this time to more and more recognize the need. There is only one more step that is necessary. 
and that is that those who realize what is necessary, what must be done, must prepare themselves to do it. It is not enough to know that change is needed. We must know what kind of change and how it is going to be brought about. We must have the training to recognize the difference between change and progress, that things can change without getting much better, but they can also be always changed for the better. We have to have the necessary skills to express and, in, and dominate and, and apply the principles that we know to be necessary. We must therefore not only become dedicated, we must become informed. We must know the truth before it can make us free. We must understand wisdom before we can simply vote for it. We've got to know the things that have to be done. We have to not only dedicate our lives to searching for realities, but we must learn how to use them if we find them. We have to find out how to apply them to the immediate problems of personal life. Great political change is inevitable, and it is coming through a mass motion of the politically uh, unfavored. There are many different things that are going to happen. Among other things, some of those things that happen are going to be unpleasant for us too, because most people have become too set in their comforts. They, have be, they would rather be like the dragon that was uh, guarding the treasures of the Nibelung in the story of Siegfried. When Siegfried, uh, Siegfried annoys the dragon, the dragon roars out loud, says, let me sleep. So it died, guarding its treasure. And we, uh, we don't want to be disturbed. If things with the individual are reasonably possible, he never has known them to be good, but they become accustomed to them. You may not have the courage to make the changes that are needed. Some people who will consider themselves a little above the average will be disturbed. But this disturbance is for the better. For everything that happens to, to shake us out of this lethargy that we have fallen into, uh, will be of permanent value to all concerned. We know definitely that there is nothing that lives that is not eternal. There is nothing real that can die. There is nothing real in our own composition that is going to die. There is only a change of worlds and there is a change of bodies and if we are sincere and intelligent people every change will be for the better. We are going to help you all be more than we have ever been before. And the things we need to do are better deeds than we have ever done. We just have to do them. We have to put a universal reality prominent in our thinking. We have to think in terms of this great plan and the great purposes for which we were intended in order that we may help to make this plan come true in its due time. Therefore, <coughs> therefore I think Hammurabi's other code comes in a little bit into this and that is that we are no longer going to be able uh, to divide civilization into classes with arbitrary limitations. We are not really going to be able to decide that this person is more uh, privileged than another person. There are no privileges in nature. There are opportunities but we have to make them privileges only by our own use of them. It is our privilege to have patience. It is our privilege to be kind. It is our privilege to be generous. And it is our privilege to carry the responsibilities of life with dignity and with quiet with strength of spirit. We have privilege to do all kinds of things if we are willing to take with those privileges the responsibilities which they involve. Unless we do take the responsibilities, the privileges can become a very heavy and dangerous burden upon the spirit. We must try in every way that we can to reach forward into the future, not because it makes things easier, but because it makes things better. And making things better is the secret of survival. It's no longer a case of where we can put this off for another generation or two. We are coming very close to a final decision. And as we look at the paper every day, discounting it somewhat, 
Uh, but uh, as we study the reports that we get and uh, eliminate the exaggerations, we find ourselves in the presence of a major human motion, a tremendous realization that things cannot continue as they are, and also a realization that if we allow them to continue as they are, they will get worse. This is a law of nature. This is a, a true philosophical Murphyism, if there ever was one. We are therefore contrived to do it better. We've got to start in to find ways to conserve natural resource and most of all educate our young for a world that we may not live to see. We've got to make sure that these young people have guidance spiritually and morally, ethically and physically. We must demand of our education that it make possible the production of an adult human being. It is not necessarily possible to produce enough accountants or computer operators to save civilization. We've got to have more individuals with their skills but also with their principles. They've got to stand for what they believe, they've got to refuse to cooperate with corruption, and they've got to have faith in the integrities of life. We must have a solid religion that is non-theological, a religion based on the fact that deity stands for the in infinite, the inevitable, and the ultimate good. By when we do this, we have a religion that any normal human being can use. All over the world now, where atheistic cultures have been built up, they have a resurgence of religious belief. More and more, religion is returning. As Napoleon pointed out, you can conquer people uh, with an army, but if you can only become a leader in peace with the help of religion. Therefore, we must have a, a realization that many people, millions of people, find they cannot live without spiritual consolation and strength. And regardless of the politics under which they function, they are returning to the solid foundations of the belief in God and hope in God's infinite mercy. Then there is no reason why, under a tree system such as ours, that we should make it impossible for our young people to recognize religion as an essential part of education. It is just as important as reading, writing, and arithmetic. It is just important that the individual have ideals as it is that he can work algebra. In fact, it is more important. And it is much more important for a university graduate to, to graduate with a solid foundation of idealism than in any art or science in which he may major. These things have to become part of our way of life. And they're coming. Well, we have a large absur uh, upsurge of belief in faith at this time. Not here, all alone, but everywhere in the world. Old churches, temples, mosques, and pagodas that were closed are open again. Because humanity in its need must have God, must have faith, must have inner security, which no amount of physical or political assurance can bestow. <clears throat> that we have to depend upon something within ourselves to survive stress. And that survival is very largely vested in our hope that we are part of a plan ruled over by divine wisdom and an infinite love that can take care of all the problems with which we are faced. So we have now, I think, one decision we have to make in our own lives, and that is whether we are going to return to copy our way of life from nature, or whether we're going to allow it to be engineered for us by various intellectual groups that have never succeeded in solving a problem. It is time to go back and study the birds and the bees. It is time for us to go back and look at the sunsets. And it is time for us to regain that quiet faith that comes from those who realize that we live in a universe of ultimate and infinite love. And that it's only our own selfishness that makes things look so bad. I think we will find gradually that the return to nature, nature's laws, nature's will, can rescue us from the involved political 
chicanery of those who are trying to work their way out of a problem by creating a new one. This we can we can do. We will have to go away, go along for a while without making too much uh, change or we may get into too much trouble. But for the most part, down inside, we've got to keep in mind forever that we have to grow, that we are growing, that we will grow. And with our growth comes the solution of problem and the perpetuation of this beautiful planet on which we live and which we have more or less only abused for thousands of years. We've got to learn to love the planet and as well as the people on it. We've got to learn to love the laws that have given us a beautiful world and we must dedicate ourselves once more to making this world as beautiful as, it re as we received it. We received a garden and we cannot end with a dump yard. We've got to learn to restore that garden and in so doing fulfill the destiny for which we are naturally intended. Thank you very much.